So we are going to start this new topic, um, more or less where we left off our discussion on probability. And <coughs> for that, I'd like to talk a little bit about a practical approach to the multiplication rule. So we already did an example, the, the tools in a bin example, where we had a bin with multiple tools and I wanted different probabilities, right, of selecting different types of tools. Now we're, we're dealing with, with, with this type of experiment by looking at it as an experiment with multiple steps. So we have a bin, 50 tools, and from our previous experiment, we knew that, what was it, uh, 10 were craftsmen, and then 40 were Black & Decker. And I said, okay, what's the probability that first you choose one, then you choose the other, and, and that's good. Sometimes we can find probabilities of choosing multiple multiple tools, um, as long as we choose them in some order. So if we select a tool at random and then another tool and then another tool and then another tool, um, I think it was Renee or one of the other students that was asking, you know, how, how do we write this down in terms of nomenclature, right? A P of B given C cap B or something like that. And, and I know that we can definitely write this with our nomenclature, but uh, sometimes it just becomes a little bit too, too much because then we end up writing more than what we're actually calculating. So instead, uh, I would like to say that um, we can focus right on looking at each step individually and then just looking at the probabilities of each step. So try not to think of equations now, try not to think of, of, of what intersections are. Let's just focus something only in terms of the steps taken. So for example, let's say that I have my 50 tools and first I'm going to choose a black and Decker. What's the probability for that? First step, choose a black and decker. What's the probability for that? 40, yep, 40 out of 50, four out of five, correct. And then let's say that I wanna choose another black and decker. What's the probability for that? For another black and decker, no replacement. Okay, so sampling without replacement. Step number two, I'm choosing another black and decker. Yeah. Correct, that's correct. I hope you see what, what's happening here, right? We're, we're, we're just taking into account that we now don't have 40, we have 39 black and deckers, and now we, don't, we no longer have 50, we have 49 tools in total, right? Um, we can select another black and decker, and that gives me 38 out of 48. We can select another Black & Decker, 37 out of 47. And we can select another Black & Decker. By the way, Jaden, you are unmuted. I'm not sure if you know. And we Let's can select, that. no problem, another Black & Decker. So we, we can just continue selecting, right? Selecting our, our Black & Deckers, right? So 36 out of 46. And in the end, if we want the probability of all of these steps occurring, all we have to do is multiply these. In this case, it's about 0.311, and that's it. So while you already know how to write this in, in more or less of a statistical notation saying, well, this is B, this is the probability of B given B, this is the probability of B given the intersection of B and B, this is the probability of B given B given the intersection of B and B, and we can keep doing this all, all along, but really, if you just focus on the steps and then the probabilities of each step, then you should be able to find a probability in a relatively simple way without really getting lost in the equations. And, and this is the practical approach that I would like for you, for you to take in this class, um, because whenever we use sampling without replacement, we will most likely um, look at multiple steps, five, 10, 15 different steps. So in order for you not to get lost in equations and trying to rearrange the equation and trying to put them all together, it, it would be nicer if you can just focus on each step in terms of a probability and that probability being, well, 
how much do I have left of what I need? How much do I have left of everything? And, and obviously, because we're doing sampling without replacements, then every time you, you complete a new step, then you have one less tool, okay? So now that we understand this, now that we have a, a bit of a practical approach, um, I'd like to give a new rule. We already talked about the multiplication rule. Now let's talk about the total probability rule. Now, what the total probability rule tells me is that for any two events, right, events A and events B, for whatever, any, any two events, the probability of event B is going to be equal to the intersection of B and A plus the intersection of B and the complement of A. Of course, we can write these intersections by going back to our multiplication rule. Remember the multiplication rule tells us that the probability of an intersection is equal to the conditional probability times the probability of the first event that occurred. So in terms of the multiplication rule, we can say that the probability of B cap A is simply the conditional probability of B given A times the probability of A. And the probability of B cap A prime is the conditional probability of B given A prime times the probability of A prime. Now, I know that's a bit of a long equation here. So let's try to see where this equation comes from, at least graphically speaking, so that we are all more or less on the same page, okay? If I have a sample space, and within that sample space, I am going to have two events, okay? I am going to have my event A, and my event A will be, let's say it's all of this. So this is my event A. And I'm going to have a second event, which will be my event B. And B is this little oval shaped event. Okay. Let's see if we can use this little graphical example to put this into play. So right now, if I would like to find the probability of B, you already know that all I have to do is take the area of B and figure out its ratio compared to the area of the sample space. The area of the sample space should be one, so really it's just the area of B. But notice the following. If I ask you to highlight B cap a where is that here maybe i can i can name all these regions i'm going to call this one one i'm going to call this region two i'm going to call this region three i'm going to call this region four so what region is b cap a the intersection of b and a two right because b is this blue oval a is this green blob so b cap a is simply region number two now, we know that if all of this blob is A, then everything else in the sample space is A prime. So what is B cap A prime then? The intersection of B and A prime. Yeah, that's right, region three. And notice that if you add regions two and three, that's B, that's the probability of B. So that's the total probability rule, right? The probability of any event is equal to the intersection of the probability of that event with another event plus the intersection of that event with the complement of the other event. And it works for anything, right? It works for any two events. Because if we're, just, if we're looking at this A and A prime together make up the sample space, therefore, we're just looking for the intersection of B with what, what makes up the sample space, right? The intersection of B with the entire sample space. So that is the total probability rule. And like I mentioned earlier, um, we can use the multiplication rule to express these um, intersections in terms of conditional probabilities as well. The total probability rule 
is going to help us to understand a, a little bit of, of independence. But let's keep that in mind because we are going to use this rule, just like the multiplication rule, we are going to use this rule to define some other, um, some other prob properties of, or so the properties of probabilities. Yeah, some other properties of the pro probabilities. So that is the total probability rule. We're not going to do an example just yet. Um, I think we can save those a little bit for next week. But the whole point of me trying to introduce the total probability rule to you is so that we can introduce the concept of independence. So what is independence? I'm going to need my patriotic American students to define this for me, but, but what is independence? Freedom, yes. Um, I read that uh, in Mel Gibson's voice, which I know he's not American. Uh, the, he's not playing an American in that movie, but anyway, I like that. Yeah, free from the influence of something else. Uh, that sounds a little bit better. Um, um, not being under control. Okay, good. I, I like Christian's um, definition, right? Free from influence, right? It's like the idea of independence, right? Is that it does not depend, right? The dependence, the independence, it doesn't depend on something else. So when I say that two events are independent, <laughs> when I say that two events are independent, so I'll say that A and B are independent. What am I saying here specifically? <clears throat> what do you think I'm saying? When I say A and B are independent, what, what does that really mean? The two do not affect each other. That's absolutely right. The two do not affect each other. They have no influence on each other. So whether or not A occurs will have no bearing on whether or not B occurs and vice versa. In other words, if two events, are, if A and B are independent, then the probability of A given B and the probability of A should be the same. Because it doesn't matter whether or not B has occurred, the probability of A doesn't change because they are independent, right? They don't influence each other. And likewise, the probability of B given A is the same as simply the probability of B. Because whether or not A has occurred, that will have no bearing on whether or not B will occur. Now we can take that a step further, right? We can say that the probability of the intersection of A and B is going to be equal to the probability of A times the probability of B, right? Because these events are, are independent. And remember, from the multiplication rule, we know that the probability of A cap B was equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A. But we already know that B given A, the probability of B given A is the same as B. So we can say this, the probability of A cap B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. Now, why do I want to give you this? Not because I'm, I'm asking you to memorize a, a set of different equations, but I, I, do want you, I do want you to think of the following. And, and think about this before you answer. For two events to be independent, right? Do they have to be mutually exclusive? Can they be mutually exclusive? Mutually exclusive is that they don't have events that overlap. So does that mean that they are independent? If two events are independent, are they mutually exclusive and vice versa? Not necessarily. Why not? Well, if they're independent, then, then there's something. They could both be, if we're doing true and false, they could both be true. They could both be false. They don't affect each other, so it doesn't matter. Exactly, right? And there's actually an easier way to look at this. You're right, by the way. But remember that for mutually exclusive events, what's the probability of their intersection? Remember, their intersection was going to be a null set. So what was the probability of their intersection for mutually exclusive events? 
is uh, zero, impossible. Zero, right? Exactly. So for mutually exclusive events, the probability of their intersection is zero. But for two independent events, the probability of their intersection is non-zero, right? Assuming that A and B are, are actual events that contain outcomes. So two events that are exclusive don't have to be independent and vice versa. In fact, I would go as far as to say that they're not, right? Two events that are exclusive are not independent and vice versa. And I know this is a little bit maybe hard to grasp because sometimes you think, well, they're exclusive means they have nothing in common. And if they have nothing in common and they don't affect each other, but that, that's actually not true, right? Independent just means that the probability of one occurring does not affect the other occurring. But mutual exclusive just means that one and the other are completely different events, like they have completely different outcomes. So it's like rolling two dice. Yeah, correct. Right? The rolling one dice doesn't really affect what the second dice is going to give, assuming the dice, the dice are all perfectly balanced and they're all the same. Okay? So that, that is uh, the concept right, of independent events. And remember, Independent events and mutually exclusive events are not the same thing, okay? So we, we want to keep that in mind. Independent events and mutually exclusive events are not going to be the same thing. So it's important for us to understand when two events are or are not independent. And, and we, need, we really need to understand this because we cannot develop conclusions and interpretation of data if we don't really understand this correctly. So I'm going to ask you some questions. Some of these questions are going to be a little bit harder to answer than others. And some of these may be a little bit more comfortable to others. But these are, at least some of these are real questions that people have used either correctly or incorrectly to draw conclusions that are correct or incorrect just based on that. So my first question and, and maybe think about this and, and don't try to think about 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 the question just, just just think of data and just think of data okay um do you think a person's financial status is independence it's sorry it's independent of their propensity to commit a crime and here we're thinking in terms of data okay i'm not generalizing to everyone okay do you think it's not independent not always so bailey i i, I think remember because we're looking at data there's no not always or sometimes. It's like it, it's 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 yes or no basically, right? Is that's the question? Is it independent? And it looks like uh, some students say no. Financial status is actually not independent from propensity to commit a crime. Okay, H how could we know that? Well, we could look at data. We could look at, at, at demographics. Uh, we could look at um, economic data, and then we can look at, at, at crime data, and then you know we can try to come up with trends. Okay. I have a question. Um, another one. This one will be a little bit easier to answer. Do you think a person's geographical location, right, where they were born, maybe where they were raised, is that independent of the native language they speak? No. Okay. I said, okay, so, so you're saying that a person's geographical location does have some bearing in the influence the native language of that person. Okay. Do you think... A car's color, right? The color of a car is independent of its engine performance. Let's say how many miles per gallon? Yes? Okay. Anyone else? Okay. So I, I, I like that you're thinking about this. I, I'm assuming that you're thinking in terms of, at least for that last question, you're probably thinking in terms of, of, of physics. You know, the, would a different color actually affect the aerodynamics of the car or something, or does it somehow affect the engine? Maybe for the previous two, you were thinking more in terms of, of, uh, of sociology, right? It's like, you know, the, does your geographical location actually dictate what language will you speak? Now, I would like for you to understand that the way I'm wording these questions, I'm asking if one event is independent of the other. That doesn't mean that one event dictates the other. But what it does mean is that one event may influence the other. And, and those are two different things, right? Um, for example, if we say, well, geographical location is not independent from native language, does that mean that everybody born in 
country speaks Spanish as a native language? No, maybe a majority, maybe 98%. I think uh, statistics for Puerto Rico was, were like 98, 99% of Puerto Ricans speak Spanish as a native language, but there's actually some Puerto Ricans, very, very small number, you know, that they're born from, uh, of missionaries or, or maybe just born of American families who, who, who moved there and, and their native language is actually English. Whether or not they speak Spanish is a, is a different story, but their native language may not be Spanish. So these are not um, generalized truths that apply to everything. All we're saying is that a person's geographical location may influence, may have some influence in what native language they speak. There are exceptions, of course. And there's also places where this, they are less, oh, lost connection. Let's see, can you hear me now? Hello, hello, testing one, two, three. Hmm, yes? Okay, that's good. So, <clears throat> so here's the thing. Um, what I'm saying is, when I say that two events are independent or are not independent, so they are dependent on each other, that means that they may influence one another, right? That doesn't mean that they have to dictate one another, okay? And this is something that sometimes it's hard to understand statistically, but as students of statistics, this is what we're going to be dealing with, right? We're looking at trends. We are looking at how things influence each other. We're not saying, and we know this just by definition, we're saying that one, let's say, that, that one event is going to occur all the times because statistics by definition is the study of what? Of events that have multiple different outcomes. So we're not saying that one truth is going to hold for every single possible case, but we are saying that the probability of it may be influenced by certain factors and maybe we can figure out what those factors are. Now, if any of you have been alive in the past four to six years, maybe even four to eight years, then you have probably seen uh, people, whether in the news or, or, or in TV shows or whatever, or, or just in your general lives, use different statistics, right, to try to argue some sort of truth, right, some sort of truth that, that needs to be applied universally. And the funny thing is that you probably see people using the same data to argue different points of view, completely different points of view, because again, our experiments will all have different outcomes, multiple outcomes. So a good study of statistics, in my opinion, would be a study of the trends and, and how those probabilities are affected by different events. But then an, in, a good interpretation of statistics would be an interpretation that actually considers data as a whole. So something as trivial as flipping a coin, I, I mean, it's, it's fairly easy for us to say it's 50-50 and we don't really care about which side is heavier than which. But when you go something a little bit more crucial, like crime statistics, then, then we need to be a little bit careful, right? Because if we just look at a graph and come up with a conclusion and say, this conclusion applies to everything, then maybe we're not really doing statistics correctly. And in fact, I, I would go as far as to say we're not doing statistics correctly. So in this class, I would like to go through, right, how we figure out whether or not two events are independent. Now, you have answered some questions, right? Whether financial status is independent of propensity to commit a crime, whether geographical location is independent of native language, whether a car's color is independent of engine performance. And I'm assuming you've answered them based on your own experience, based on however much you know about physics, however much you know about geography and sociology, and however much you know about crime statistics. And that's good. But there's actually a way to figure out or determine if two events are independent by looking at data. In other words, by getting concrete quantifiable data, you are able to determine if two events are independent or not. So before we go into how to figure out whether or not two events are independent, let's do a quick example to make sure that we understand uh, how to spot independence or make sure we understand how we see independence, okay? So the most common example of independent values are, are those of sampling with replacement. Okay. So remember when, when I say sampling with replacement, what that means is that you take a sample, then you place it back. So if we do sampling with replacement on our 50 tool toolbox, 
what that means is that we will always have 50 tools, regardless of how many we take, because we're always replacing them. So 10 RC and 40 R event B. If I say, what is the probability that you select a craftsman, it is going to be 10 out of 50. What if you replace that craftsman and pick another one? What's the probability that that's going to be a craftsman? It's also going to be 10 out of 50. The same, right? Because now you still have 10 craftsmen, craftsmen, craftsmen. You still have 10 of those tools and you still have 50 total tools. If you replace it again, what's the probability of selecting another craftsman is going to be again, 10 out of 50. So what this is telling me, right, is that the probability of C, right, in this case, and the probability of C given C, they're actually the same. And, you know, those two events are independent. The, fir the first craftsman, the second craftsman, they're independent of each other because you are replacing the tools. So whenever you see sampling with replacement, you have to think we are talking about independence. Okay, whenever we see sampling with replacement, then we are talking about independence. But then how do we determine maybe from a more mathematical point of view, how do we determine if two events are independent? Yes, you can look at data. Yes, you can see, if, you can try to identify terms, but it would be a little bit easier if there was a way to maybe put our data somewhere and, and figure out if, if that data is or isn't independent. So for that, um, I would like to talk a little bit about Bayes' theorem. Thomas Bayes was a Presbyterian minister and probably one of the more important names in the field of statistics. Um, Bayes is credited with the development of Bayesian probability or Bayesian statistics, which essentially is a way of interpreting probability as a reasonable expectation of an event instead of a frequency of an event. So right now we've been treating probability as a more or less a frequency. We have 50 tools, 10 belong to, to one group. So what's the probability of that group being selected? 10 out of 50, that's a frequency, right? How many times does that group occur in the whole group of 50? That's probability as a frequency. But Bayes' theorem, or, or sorry, Bayesian statistics, instead of looking at probability as a frequency, we look at it as a reasonable expectation. And then how do we develop reasonable expectation? Like, what does that even mean? That sounds a little bit subjective. Well, a reasonable expectation consists of, okay, taking prior knowledge and prior knowledge is essentially our initial probability and then combining that prior knowledge with new available data. Now, statistically, um, this is what we call evidence. The result of this combination, I, I'm writing plus, it's not really something that you're adding. I'm just saying that you take prior knowledge and to that you add new available data, not, not mathematically add, just like add from a philosophical point of view, I guess. But you add that new available data and the output, the result is going to be new knowledge. which is what we call posterior probability. So that's the idea behind Bayes' theorem and behind Bayesian statistics, right? You take prior knowledge, you combine this with new available data, and then you turn it into new knowledge, which will be different, right? More updated than prior knowledge. If we go back to the example of the um, Chinese rocket pieces, we had prior knowledge, so an initial probability of where the rocket would land, but every time the rocket would get closer to the atmosphere, we would have new available data, like where is it at this point, and we could use that new available data to update our prior knowledge into new knowledge. So we update our initial probability into a posterior probability 
through the use of evidence. Now, you may realize that this is actually uh, a method that you probably already use in your daily lives, right? You have your prior knowledge, you update that knowledge with new available data. And that's essentially, you know, not just a scientific method, that, that's just a, a method that kind of helps with, with life in general, right? To update your prior knowledge with new available data, with new evidence. And Christian says on the chat, well, most people, LOL. <laughs> yeah, um, mathematically, there's actually a, a very, very nice, very clean and very beautiful way of expressing Bayes' theorem. And that is found by taking the um, multiplication rule, right? We have the probability of A cap B. We know that that is um, the probability of, of uh, A given B times the probability of B, or vice versa, B given A times the probability of A. We, we know that that's all the same, right? The probability of B given A times the probability of A. But if we take this and we rearrange it to solve for the probability, let's say, of A given B, we get a nice, um, I would say, almost beautiful way of expressing Bayes' theorem, of expressing this idea. And that is that the probability of A given B will be equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A and then divided by the probability of B. This is the most common way of expressing Bayes' theorem. It's a very, very um, important equation in statistics. It's going to help us to understand um, how to update my information. And of course, because we are expressing it in terms that we've already covered, in terms of conditional probability, in terms of initial probability, then we can actually use this, right? You know, and to, to calculate probabilities um, in a more mathematical way, which is what we've been practicing so far. I know all this sounds like a lot of talk, so let's actually see if we can put this together through an example. This is actually, um, I think it may be from your book. Uh, I, I could be wrong, but I think this example is from your book. And that is a medical diagnosis example. Actually, it is from your book, yes. A medical diagnosis example. And <laughs> I have a question. I'm sorry about that. I have a question. Let's say you are testing yourself from, for some sort of illness or virus, um, which whatever virus you want. If, if you're tired of hearing COVID examples, which probably your professors have tried to incorporate in your class one way or another, then we can just call it something else. If you test positive for that virus, do you have the virus? Okay, some people say yes probably Democrats, and some people say most likely. Okay, okay, that's good, that's good. Some people say no, we found the Republican. Okay, good, good, I get it, good. Um, the fact is that no test is actually like, no, no viral test is actually like 100% effective in saying whether or not you have something. So let's just give you some, um, some, some data, some, some historical data. Let's say you're administering a test to diagnose an illness, okay? the probability that the test correctly identifies someone with the illness as positive is 99%. In other words, the probability that you are ill and you test positive is 99%. Um, I think in, in, um, in, 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 in medical diagnosis, this is what this is called the sensitivity. Not really relevant to us, but in case you're wondering, this is, this is what we call the sensitivity of the test. Okay, so the test has a sensitivity of 99%. That means that if you are ill and the probability that you will test positive is 99%. Now, the probability that you are not ill and you test negative is 
for this one will be 95%. In medical diagnosis, this is called the, specif the specificity. And let's say that the incidence of the illness in the general population, so the probability that you are ill, just based on the general population, is uh, 0.01%. So 0 0.0001, right? 0.01%. So that's the information that's given to us. And, and all viral tests are like this. Okay, it's not just not just this one for this example. Like no test really has 100% sensitivity, 95% uh, specificity, okay, or 100% specificity, okay? So my question would be, if you take the test and the result is positive, are you ill based on this information? If you take the test and you test positive, are you ill? Okay. We say, we, we see a yes here, okay. We see a no, we see a probably, we see a I don't know anymore, okay. Well, we don't know, right? Um, the answer is actually, well, nobody knows. <clears throat> we can't really deal with, with, with exactness. We, we have to deal with probabilities. So I think you can say, well, the question is not whether or not you are ill. The question is, what is the likelihood that you're ill? What's the probability that you are ill if you test positive? Okay, so we are going to use Bayes' theorem in order to figure out what that probability is. Okay, now for that, um, I need to come up with some names for these events, right? Um, I'm going to say that D is the event that you are ill. So disease, D for disease. So D means you are ill. And let's say that S is the event that you test positive. If D means that you are ill, then D prime will be that you're not ill. And if S means that you tested positive, then S prime means that you tested negative. And this is without even counting inconclusive and all those things, which, which even add a little bit more nuance to our problem. But let's just deal with these two variables, illness and positive test, okay? If I'm saying, what is the probability that you are ill Right, the probably you have the, 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 the virus, given that you tested positive, how can I write that? The probability that you are ill if you tested positive. What should I write here? Probability of what? I already tested positive, that, that, that already happened. So after I tested positive, I'd like to know what's the probability that I am ill. How does that work? D given S, correct, right. The probability of D, given S, that's absolutely right. That's the probability of me being ill, given that I tested positive. However, Bayes' theorem, okay, Bayes' theorem, what does that tell me? Bayes' theorem tells me that the probability here of D given S will be equal to the probability of S given D times the probability of D divided by the probability of S. So I can actually write down Bayes' theorem for this problem. And you'll say, okay, but we still need to figure out S given D. And I mean, we, we can try to write Bayes' theorem again or, or again and again, that, that doesn't really help me, but it's okay because we already have some information here given to us, right? So what is that information? We know that the probability that you are ill and you test positive is 99%, that's sensitivity. And that means that if you are ill, then the probability that you test positive is 99%. Can anybody tell me how I can write down this probability in terms of these variables? The probability that you are already ill and then you test positive. How do we write that in terms of D, S, maybe D prime S prime, I don't know. The probability that you are already ill and then you test positive. Exactly, the probability of S given D, we already know that's 99%. Good. Now, what is the probability of D? Well, D is simply the probability that you are ill. 
right? D is ill. And we already know the probability that you are ill, at least uh, that you are ill in the general population is 0.0001. But now we need to figure out what's the probability that you test positive, PS. Now this one's a little bit hard because there's no data of how many people have taken the test, right? There's, there's no data here. Nobody, I don't know here, given this information, how many people have taken the test. But here's where we can turn to our total probability rule, right? Remember the total probability rule. Let me see if I can find it here in my, in my old notes. The total probability rule tells me that I can find the probability of any event by looking at it as a function of the intersections of the event with any other event and the complement of that other event. So what I can do is I can take the probability of S, the probability that you test positive, and look at it as the probability of the intersection of S and D plus the probability of the intersection of S and what? using the total probability rule, what would this have to be? D prime, correct? Correct, that's absolutely right, thank you. And of course, using the multiplication rule, I know that the probability of this intersection is simply going to be the probability of S given D times PD, and the probability of S given D prime times P D prime. And you'll notice that now we can actually work with this, right? The probability of S given D, that means what is the probability that you test positive given that you're already sick? We already solved that one, right? That is uh, 99%. So this will be 99% multiplied by the probability that you are ill. Well, we already know the probability that you're ill. So the incidence in the general population is 0.01%. plus the probability that you test positive given that you are not ill. Well, how do we look at this? Well, we know that if you're not ill, the probability that you test negative is 95%. If you're not ill, then what is positive? We know that you're not ill, negative is 95, correct. One minus 95% or simply 5%. And we know that the probability that you're not ill is what? Well, the probability that you're ill is 0 0.0001. The probability that you're not ill is what? Remember the, the complement of D, right? Exactly. One minus the probability of D. So one minus 0 0.0001. So notice that we've already found the probability of S. I mean, you have to solve all this, but we, we found the probability of S. And we know the probability of D, we know the probability of S given D, we can actually insert all this into Bayes' theorem to figure out what's the probability that you actually have the illness given that you have tested positive. Now I'm gonna let you do all the math here and give me a number, but just so that you can compare it with my result, that number should be about 0.2%. Okay. I can tell that all the Republicans are cheering like, yeah, low probability. But I mean, that, that's just what Bayes theorem tells us, okay? So you, you try to do the math yourself. Um, and, and of course, we're gonna continue in the next class with, we, we can go into a little bit more, more depth and detail about this example, about what it actually means from a statistical point of view. And then I would like to give a, a talk a little bit of a, a practical approach to Bayes theorem.